afternoon everybody we're going to be talking about passion and destruction today whenever you get an essay that will be on the comparative prose text it will be led by a quotation and this is a quotation that mr anderson and i came up with passion is presented as a destabilizing and ultimately destructive force and then of course what you need to do is you need to argue how far you agree with the statement by referring to the two prose texts, okay? First thing I want to remind you of is when you write an introduction in exam, you want it to be nice and short, and you want to make very clear how you're going to define the key terms. So this is quite a difficult essay title because you've got passion, you've got destabilizing, and you've also got destructive, okay? First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about passion. What do we mean by passion? Well, in the exam, you don't have a dictionary in front of you. But you do need to make it clear to the examiner what you understand by passion. Now, passion could be a difficult word to describe. And when I spoke to the other class about this, we came up with two conflicting ideas. One is that uh, we're talking about something which is erotic and sexual. That you have passion, like a driving force. However, as the class pointed out to me, you can equally talk about passion being an obsession or something that you are absolutely dedicated to. Now, you might have, say, for instance, a passion for literature, might you not? And you're not, therefore, in that context, talking about something being sexual or physical, are you? You're talking about something being compulsive and obsessive, okay? So I think it's very important, in, as English literature students, that we're always thinking about meanings and we're thinking about definitions. By destabilizing, what do I mean? Well, we mean it's something that takes the status quo every day, the way things are now, and it wants to change or threaten that. And destructive is a bit different from destabilizing, because destructive has a very negative connotation. You can destabilize in a positive way, can't you? You can change something conservative and you can make it creative. But destruction usually is something which we see as negative, okay? So I wanted to take some time just to remind you that the actual way that you define terms will determine what your argument is going to be. Now, a little bit of psychology here. Who does psychology? Here we are. Here's our little love triangle. Um, and this is... Oh, my God. Our little love triangles here. This comes from an Oklahoma State psychologist, Robert Sternberg, okay? And he devised what he called the triangular theory of love. What's interesting about this is you will notice that passion is one of the corners of the triangle. And what he's actually saying is that passion is necessary for a successful relationship. I found that quite interesting, you know, because sometimes passion gets a very bad press, doesn't it? Passion is a synonym for infatuation, something that's short-lived. And therefore, if we take that kind of approach, then we're more likely to see it as destructive. But if we take this other kind of approach, which is that passion is necessary for love, then I think that we're going to get a much more positive idea of what passion does in a relationship. And I'm going to suggest that, particularly in atonement, passion is seen as very positive, as a necessary part of a relationship. Okay. Now, uh, Passion is presented as a destabilizing force, and what I'm going to look at firstly is the origin of a relationship determines the quality of its passion, so how it starts. The destructive outcomes of some relationships are caused by conservative recodings of passion. Now, what do I mean by that? It's quite a complicated thing. What I mean by that is that passion is seen by another person, as in the case of Bryony, for instance, as very negative. And what I'm going to be arguing today is it's not so much the passion that is destructive as the conservative person who sees it and interprets it as destructive and causes the negative consequences. And the two villains in today's lesson will be Bryony in Atonement and will be Tom Buchanan and Daisy, of course, in The Great Gatsby. And the third thing I'm going to point out in this lecture today is that it's very ironic that in our two novels, that the stable relationships are the ones that are without passion. What are the two stable relationships? The ones that are lifelong marriages. 
one, Tom and Daisy. You don't get the impression that they're going to split up at the end, do you? They will be united by their conspiracy and their lie. Isn't that exactly the same as the fact that Lola and Paul Marshall are the only successful marriage in atonement? And if you re recall, there's that key quotation that we need to remember, which is walled up in the mausoleum of their marriage, okay? So these two relationships without passion are very stable, but I wouldn't argue that they're held up as very ideal relationships. In fact, their lack of passion makes them seem torpid, dead, almost like a sentence. So firstly, the origin of relationship does, uh, determines the quality of its passion, okay? So why does it matter how a relationship begins? How might the beginning of a relationship affect the quality of the passion? Well, let's start with atonement. You recall, don't you, that the relationship is almost instantaneous, and it comes from the fountain sea. And so immediately we have a relationship of passion, don't we? We have a relationship where when uh, Robbie is in the bath, thinking about Cecilia, we realize that the origin of the relationship is immediately in passion, it's in desire, it's in lust, it's incredibly physical. Um, in the case of uh, the great Gatsby, it's a little bit more complicated because we don't actually get the relationship described in real time, do we? The relationship is described via Jordan, do you remember? But what we can remember is that Jordan, as she's described by Nick, is not a passion, a passionate character, is she? Far from it. She's described as quite a cold character, isn't she? However, when she describes Gatsby and Daisy getting together, do you recall what she says? She says, he looked at her the way every girl wants to be looked at. Do you remember that? So uncharacteristic for Jordan. It shows that she saw the beauty of his passion. Yeah? So he's absolutely passionate about Daisy from the beginning. And he's sent away to war. And that passion is going to give him drive and it's going to give him energy. And we're going to see that in Robbie's and Cecilia's relationship too. What is it that that motivates Robbie to survive jail as a sexual predator? What is it that causes Robbie to walk across France as a wounded and dying man? In both cases, it's passion that drives him forward. Are we going to argue that that's destructive? At this point, I don't think it works to argue that it's destructive. I'm going to argue that it's constructive, that it's motivating. Okay. Now, in atonement, the fountain scene is very important because when we first look at it, the passion that we see in the fountain scene when Cecilia strips off and sort of shows herself, exhibits herself to Robbie, it is done through, done through the lens of Brian. And so therefore, we might argue the passion is seen as destructive. Do you recall that she sees uh, Robbie as a kind of ogre, as a magician, as an enchanter that is controlling her sister's mind? And that's because she doesn't recognize that the passion is neutral, does she? And the key thing to remember is that our focalizer is pre-adolescent. She's on the cusp of sexuality. Always remember this, guys. What's absolutely key is that our focalizer knows enough about sex to recognize it, but not enough to understand it. So immediately she recodes the passion as perversion, doesn't she? And therefore she sees it as destructive, because she doesn't recognize what it is. Okay, we've already spoken about Jordan's account, and all I wanted to add at this particular time is just to talk about the fact that it's very interesting that Fitzgerald chose Jordan to tell us that story. Because she is the character that seems to be least passionate with Nick. They have a very sterile relationship, don't they? They're completely the opposite of Daisy and of Gatsby, who seem to be driven by passion. 
So this is the conservative recoding of passion, okay? And I've said the way that we regard passion is going to depend on how we code it. If you're a conservative, often passion is seen as a destabilizing force. Why do conservatives dislike destabilizing forces? Well, because they want to keep things as they are. Their job is to maintain the status quo, isn't it? The Talus household in atonement is a conservative household. It wants things to stay as they are. So one of the ideas that we need to bring in, if we're talking about destabilizing and destruction, would be if you're a class-based person who believes in hierarchy and you see passion between the classes, you will see it as destructive, won't you? As destroying the rightful hierarchy of society. And that, of course, is the way that Bryony sees it. She is a natural conservative. That's the way Emily Tallis would see it, wouldn't she? Because we know she looks down on the police. She sees them as her inferiors. She believes in an elitist class-based world. And therefore, to her, passion is always going to be coded as a destructive force. All right? In terms of the library scene, I wanted you to remember that once again, it almost mirrors the fountain scene, doesn't it, yeah? And we actually see a relationship occur, a sexual encounter occur, which is so significant to that couple that it bonds them and cements them. And therefore, is it right to argue that the sex scene in the library is destructive? I would say, no, it's not. It's actually very unified. And it actually cements them as a couple. And one of the things that McEwen and through Bryony's narration wants you to see is that Cecilia and Robbie are ideal lovers. And I'm going to suggest to you, going back to that triangle of passion, that it is absolutely vital that they have that sex scene. And that McEwen is actually saying the physical is very much part of love and desire and cementing people together. And it's actually that scene that Robbie is going to come back to again and again in part two, because it's actually seen as a manifestation of their love and mutual attraction, okay? However, we know that once again through Bryony's focalization, that it, she recodes it to be a sexual assault, doesn't she? So she sees it as destructive. And she sees it destructive because we still, as we know, is living in a fairy tale world in which sex can only ever be a conquest of a woman by a man. She doesn't have the concept of mutual desire and of consent, does she? Again, very important that we remember her age, very important that we remember the cultural context, Catherine, and don't just condemn her. Okay, now the world can hear that Catherine Giles is very judgmental of uh, girls who've grown up in the 1930s, whereas we want the class to have historical empathy, don't we, class, yeah? We want you to understand that this is only a young girl who's very sheltered, lives in boarding school, very parochial, lives in the countryside, and that's where we'd get our AO3 in. Sometimes opinions are wrong. Uh, it is a conservative <laughs> recoding of passion by others that leads to destructive outcomes, okay? I want you to think about Gatsby now. Again, I'm going to argue, is Gatsby's passion for Daisy destructive? Is it destabilizing? Well, it's certainly destabilizing in Tom's view of the world, because Tom sees Gatsby as a despicable social climber. However, we know from the book that Nick doesn't see him that way. In fact, Nick links him to the heritage of the United States, and Gatsby becomes a kind of incorporation of the American dream. And our final scene, Lois, is of the green breast, do you remember? And that idea of purity and the origins of the United States and the fact that Gatsby is seen as one of these idolers who travel to the United States. And his passion, therefore, is seen as clean and beautiful, not destructive. Actually, it's quite idealistic, don't you feel? So why does it become destructive? It becomes destructive because the conservative forces in the book, who are personified by Tom Buchanan, 
both racially, remember his dislike of colored people, his dislike of other classes, his institutional bullying that took place at Yale. He dislikes Gatsby and he engineers it so that Gatsby becomes the tragic hero, the full guy. In actual fact, Gatsby doesn't commit the crime, does he? Daisy, a member of the establishment, does. She's, in fact, the destructive person, if the truth be known, isn't she? Why does she get away with it? She gets away with it because of social class. And I want to remind you that that links then beautifully to atonement where Paul Marshall is the destructive character. And once again, because of privilege, elitism, and the ability to manipulate the authorities, means that Paul Marshall never becomes a suspect, does he? And he also very, very cleverly uses the libel laws, you remember, later in the novel, to stop anyone talking. So I want you to see that in both cases, I would say that the authors are not saying that it is the passion of the male character, the overwhelming desire that he has for his woman. I don't think that that is the origin of the destruction. I would argue that the origin of the destruction comes from the conservative forces who manipulate truth and reality and therefore destroy our male characters, both of whom come from working class backgrounds. So I'd say there's a strong class-based reading for both of our protagonists, okay? Now, this is perhaps the most interesting thing, okay, which is the whole idea of stability. I would argue that in both novels, the stable relationships are very un unsavory relationships in the end. And um, stability, which is often seen as a very positive thing, isn't it? of keeping things the same, etc., could also be seen as being sterile and marriage just being a social institution of convenience. And that seems to be the case, I think, in both novels with the two couples who are the most stable. Well, let's think about that, okay? Well, firstly, in the Marshall's marriage, at the end, we are really presented with a despicable marriage, aren't we? Lola is actually always presented as quite a horrible predator, isn't she? Do you recall that she hides herself in the Rolls Royce? She rushes out. Her life is actually one in which she protects herself from the outside world. And as we said before, the most beautiful quotation for that is walled up in the mausoleum of her marriage. And then we can swag that, we can talk about all the connotations of death, of decay, and that is the absolute opposite of what a good marriage should be. A good marriage should be about fertility and reproduction, shouldn't it? We don't actually hear about her having children, do we? And we cannot imagine that this relationship has any affection, warmth, sexuality, erotica, desire, companionship in. It sounds like a hideous conspiratorial alliance of those two against the world because they're liars they're hypocrites, they're people who practice mendacity, the art of lying. Now, let's think about Tom and Daisy. How many of you can recall, at the end, when Nick is so disgusted at them? Remember, Nick is our focalizer all the time. He looks in at the window, what does he see? He sees uh, uh, Tom and Daisy sitting together, do you recall? They are drinking and eating, but they're not actually drinking and eating because they've lost their appetite. They have ale and cold chicken, do you remember, before them? It's a very domestic scene. In fact, it could be a very intimate, sexy scene, could it, at night, two lovers being together. But is that the feeling that we get from it? No. In fact, uh, Fitzgerald uses the, the word conspiratorially. They lean forward to conspire. And just like Paul Marshall and Lola, it seems to me that Tom and Daisy are unified not by love, not by passion, not by erotica, because we know that Tom's actually attracted erotically to Myrtle. He doesn't seem to have any particular attraction to Daisy, does he? They are attracted because now they have a lie and a secret to share. So it's interesting, isn't it, that stability is seen as hypocritical, and I don't think is presented in a positive light whatsoever. And they have no connection to the American dream. 
do they? Because the American dream is about change, isn't it? It's about being dynamic. It's about being open to things. But Tom and Daisy, if anything, are more aligned to European class hierarchical elitism. And they are not aligned to the America, the more idealized version of America that Fitzgerald presents us with at the end. They are, in fact, completely the opposite, hypocritical in every way. So just to sum up, I just want to make it very clear to you that that is just one way of arguing. But what I've tried to do is to show you quite a sophisticated argument where you take into account other variables. And this is where you might want to bring in things like Marxist criticism. Marxism, as you know, is interested primar primarily in class and how lower class people are controlled, manipulated and oppressed by wealthier people. Both novels seem to me to have very strong class readings, so that's something that you could bring in. And I think that that would be very interesting, okay? In a minute, we're going to move on and we're going to fill in our table, and then we're going to talk about writing an essay on this, okay? Thank you so much for listening.